Hello folks, welcome to Rational Science, uh, the only site on the internet that does physics for real. Yesterday I came back from Iceland, nice trip. I celebrated my 45th honeymoon, <laughs> long time. Uh, never go to Iceland, uh, it's too cold, too windy, too rainy, too expensive. Don't ever make that mistake. Okay, anyways, uh, we're going to be doing a little bit of extinction first, and then we're going to do into, go into the uh, lecture that we have today, which is on whether the electron, in fact, essentially the entire atom, whether any of that belongs to geometry. In other words, are any of those, do any of those qualify as geometric figures? Okay, and then I'll get into the questions and comments that people made for the last uh, three weeks, I'd say at least. I haven't been able to give my lecture. Okay, let's go with extinction. Let's start here. Fellow says he went to this site. He um, uh, tells me, asked me to go to this site to this uh, YouTube video. I think it was a YouTube video. And the fellow there, uh, he says the following. He goes through the whole extinction uh, thing of what happened at the KT extinction, which is the Cretaceous Tertiary extinction, which is uh, 65 million years ago, roughly. And that's when the dinosaurs died and mammals expanded. So he, this fellow uh, in the uh, video says the following. He says, one of the statements he makes, he says, even if there were no asteroid, a lot of dinosaurs and marine life would probably be gone anyway. Well, he never explained why he thinks that is the case. In fact, when you, when you listen to the uh, video, this is what you see. He, he just goes in there and uh, re regurgitates the party line. He starts out by saying that the... Uh, asteroid is the number one theory, then there could be climate change for different reasons, uh, maybe volcanoes, the uh, Deccan traps in India, and maybe, you know, um, uh, there was uh, it, uh, climate change or maybe, uh, in this case, marine regression, you know, the ocean levels drop. So what should you conclude? Well, you should conclude that these people keep telling you the same story over and over for the last 50 years. They have no different theory. If you want to have a different theory, you have to come here. There is no other place for a different theory. What's the theory here? The theory here is that um, the economy collapsed. The dinosaurs' economy collapsed. And people don't always understand what, what that really means. It means that we are animals. We are humans are animals, just like the dinosaurs were animals, the amphibians were animals, all these were animals. Okay? People think that we're not animals and that we're kind of different and we're going to die a different death than the animals in the past because we have something called intelligence. We have developed this extraordinary intelligence and that saves us from all fates. Um, I can only give you my five cents worth. <laughs> and that five cents worth is that um, Mother Nature kills through the vitals, what I call the vitals. And the vitals are not trade not commerce, not money. Um, you know, not, not all animals have money, not all animals trade, not all animals engage in commerce. All animals have some things in common. They uh, typically breathe, they typically drink water or some kind of liquid, and they typically eat something where they sometimes get their liquids from. So that's how that's uh, universal. Another universal could be that they all have children, uh, they all have, uh, they all sleep, Okay, so we have some things in common with all the other animals in the animal kingdom. And so the question is, does Mother Nature kill through money? Well, not specifically. Not specifically. Other animals don't have money. So she goes through the vitals. Now, one vital could be, you know, having fewer children. You know, she stops, she stops the species from having children. And when that happens, um, you know, uh, what we call a background extinction, yeah, the species can go extinct. However... In a, in a case of humans, we, we're probably not going to die through a what, what I call a background extinction. In other words, we're only us, we disappear, and the rest of the world continues rolling like if nothing. No, no, that ain't going to happen. When we die, everyone dies. We're going to take everyone with us, and that's known as a mass extinction. So we're going to die in a mass extinction, and for that, we need to go back to the dinosaurs and figure out how they died, how the amphibians died, how the uh, archosaurs died, how the mammal reptiles died in the Permian, and so on. We've got to go through different ages and figure out what happened to them and see if whatever killed them is going to kill us and whether we have any antidote to whatever killed them. Is intelligence, is technology, is the fact that we can foresee events, 
Does, that, does any of that help us avoid extinction or avoid the mechanism that killed all the other animals? That's, that's the reasoning here, okay? And so we go back and we find out that, yeah, that maybe they were killed through one of the vitals. Maybe uh, they lack sleep. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I think it wasn't an issue of sleep. Could it be that maybe uh, they ran out of air? Well, it could have happened. Maybe there was a climate change, a sudden climate change, no air, and they all died. Yeah, great. Uh, I don't think that happened either. No, I think uh, it goes down to uh, liquids, water, and uh, food. Okay, so um, that's more likely. And what do I mean by that? Well, if the food disappears, for sure, the food that the dinosaurs ate disappears, the herbivores will disappear, and then followed by the carnivores. Okay, so that's the idea here. And the same thing can happen to us. Food can disappear. And you say, well, how can that possibly be? We have trade. We produce all the food we want. We're all fat. <laughs> uh, well, it can disappear because we only produce food for money, for profits. The day that uh, money is no more, that we don't believe in money and, you know, in, uh, in God we don't trust anymore, <laughs> then that's uh, when money is no more, uh, we don't produce anymore because we only produce because of money or distribute because of money. And so I think that's it's going to be the same mechanism uh, in the case of man. It's just going to be through commerce, through trade, but uh, the mechanism is the same. We run out of food. It's food that's going to kill us, okay? And that's what killed the animals in the past. That's the theory we propose here. So, uh, you know, um, this notion that climate change does anything to us, that peak oil, that disease, some kind of disease kills us, that there's a volcano that's going to kill us, that there are asteroids and comets that are going to come and hit us, uh, I don't think so. None of those will ever happen. Mother Nature doesn't do extinction, mass extinctions in such a way. She does it through the vitals, primarily food and water or liquids. Okay, so that's the distinction here. Okay, another fellow brings up an issue. He says, why would you think that in an age where people are getting fatter and fatter, the world will be out of food soon? Well, again, it's got to do with economics falling apart and we produce food only because of economics, because of trade, because of commerce, because of money. Okay, for profits, that's why we produce food and distribute food. Uh, if uh, we were to wipe out money for whatever reason, then we will all, or a great majority of mankind will die because of lack of food. Very simple, very straightforward. So that's the mechanism proposed here because that's how the animals in the past died according to this site. Why would you think that in an age of uh, crypto coins and digital currencies uh, becoming popular can uh, provide basic income, yeah? You, don't you think you are rationalizing the idea of an end to all humans to cope with the fact that uh, the fall of the American empire is occurring right now and you happen to be right smack in the middle of it? Uh, yeah, maybe. It's got really nothing to do specifically with the American empire. Okay? Just when you have given up on Marxism, the Chinese socialists are becoming the world's greatest superpower and you have bet on the wrong horse by deciding to live in the United States. Well, in my case, uh, I don't live in the United States. Uh, in fact, I can't go back to the United States. And you can look me up and find out why. But um, just to address this fellow's uh, questions, let's go one by one here. Okay. And so what do we have? Well, when money disappears, whatever food there is on the planet at that moment in time, right, is a measure of how much time humans have left as a species. Crypto is just another more abstract form of currency. Okay. So crypto is just one more currency that we've invented to do trade. Humans invented money when they invented trade, which was probably sometime around, you know, the Neolithic, I would say, okay? Until then, we lived 90% of human existence, maybe more, maybe less, but thereabouts. We lived without trade. Trade was not part of our culture. And Chinese empire, there's never going to be a Chinese empire because first, uh, the powers that be will not allow the um, Chinese to gain the upper hand, either militarily or economically. Okay, uh, they're covering all those bases right now, and there might be a war because of that. There's always been wars because of economics, and that's probably what's headed our way. It's very likely, it's possible. Right now, the United States is much more powerful than China, and so Chinese have a lot of time, a lot of ground to cover. I don't think they'll ever cover it. I don't think they'll ever get there. Okay, um, there's not going to be like it's been in the past. You know, people say, well, history repeats itself. It ain't going to repeat itself this time around. There will be no uh, Greek Empire taking over the Persian Empire, no Roman Empire taking over the Greek Empire. None of that's going to happen. Uh, what's going to happen now in the last phase of man is that first the global economy is going to collapse before China ever makes it to becoming the great empire, the new empire. Uh, it's never going to happen. 
So China uh, it has wishful thinking if they think they're going to overtake the United States and become a world power. Well, I mean, the number one world power. It's never going to happen. Believe me, <laughs> have no chance whatsoever of happening. Okay, uh, besides, you know, uh, countries uh, or politicians, they learn from, from the past and they take uh, precautions that the same thing doesn't occur again, okay? And so uh, if you thought that one empire is going to take over the other one, uh, think again, okay? We're too advanced in our understanding of history and military and economic issues to allow that to happen again. Okay, I think it's the same fellow. He says, um, I, I liked a lot of these because they're like a lot of people think out there. So it's important to look at all these uh, comments and questions this fellow made. What makes you think that the whole world will want to do without money when money can be practically any type of object? Are we going to run out of objects? Okay, it's not that people voluntarily will say, well, I don't want to use money anymore. It's that money will have no value because we're devaluating it every day. And at some point, uh, the majority or a great number of workers will not be able to make it to the end of the month with the salaries that they make. And so there won't be any purpose to work because they can't pay their rent and buy food and all the other regular expenses um, uh, because they're just going to be over their heads with whatever salaries they get. And so we're approaching that situation where more and more people are going to fit into that category. That's uh, part of the theory, okay? I never understand the idea of people thinking any modern civilization will lose social classes, governments, music, or any concept that has been occurring since the late Stone Age. It would be impossible to even force, let alone let it disappear on its own. Yeah, again, uh, this is not an issue where uh, it's going to be imposed on people or that people voluntarily will do, uh, will, you know, lose all these things or decide not to use them. Uh, no, it's, it's going to be imposed by Mother Nature. Okay. Our global economy cannot continue expanding forever, specifically when the um, uh, birth rate, the global birth rate, uh, is falling. Uh, the, uh, the man's artificial economy is based, it's a pyramid scheme, right? An inverted pyramid scheme. Uh, we, we expect more demand next year, uh, companies do, and more and more and more every year. That's what companies look forward to. And uh, demand is ultimately uh, population. If population is not increasing, uh, especially exponentially as it has in the past, and it's in fact turning the corner and becoming, you know, uh, reaching an asymptote, um, that spells trouble for the global economy. And that's where we're at right now. The uh, population curve is asymptotic. That's the problem. Okay? Or that's part of the problem. Again, there are several more factors in there. What makes you think that we are no different than from any other animal when we are vastly smarter <laughs> than the T-Rex and are able to make tools and control our birth rate, assist, uh, not really true there, assist beyond our IQ limits, manipulate the genes of crops, create enough food to feed billions, and these capabilities and more are getting better every year. My God. But this is how people think. They really think like this. And uh, so these are, let me answer that. Okay, here it is. Yeah, that's how do we answer this? Well, we said food is the only currency left when the traditional currencies vanish. No one trades food when the only thing of value is food. In the asphalt jungle, where there is nothing to hunt other than another human, food is equal to survival. So nobody trades that food, the only thing of value. Smart, intelligent, resourceful humans have no power to, uh, no power or technology to do the following. We cannot travel out of the solar system. Okay, alive. And that's a long story. I'm not going to cover it now. Uh, we cannot avoid density-dependent birth rates. In other words, what's that thing that's in parenthesis next? Have children again. We're not going to have children, especially in the cities. City was not made for people, for children. Okay, so in cities, that's where we all die. That's where we end our days. Uh, we cannot extend the life expectancy to a 200, let alone I, I would even put the number a lot lower than that. I put 200 just to show that, you know, people think that they're going to live forever, that uh, technology somehow is going to make us live forever, something along those lines. No, um, it never happened and never will. Okay, so this notion that uh, we're going to be uh, living to, I don't know, 150 years, 200 years, or maybe even forever, uh, that's fantasy. That's all it is. It's fantasy in the minds of people. It's got to do a lot with the religion that we had uh, for many hundreds, maybe thousands of years where people wanted to live forever. And so they thought that after death, you still have life somehow, you know, live forever. Your spirit lives out there. Uh, we cannot recover our genetic diversity. We've already lost it. And as a species, uh, we cannot gain it again. No way of doing that. Again, I'm not going to go into detail there. Uh, we cannot live without food, water, or air, uh, no matter how uh, technologically advanced we are. Okay. We need food, water, and air. We are animals. I'm sorry. We're not uh, plants. Uh, we're not trees or, or uh, flowers or, or, or um, 
little plants there on the ground. We're not, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, we're not uh, uh, either stones or uh, sand. You know, we belong to the animal world. Okay, so, you know, again, you need food, water, and air. Those are the vitals. And again, we cannot live forever as a species either. Remember that uh, all species uh, have a beginning and they all have an end. Life does not live forever. To think that humans can live forever because of technology or some of these other factors this fellow mentioned is, again, a fantasy. That's all it is. It's just an ideal that people have in their minds. Genetic engineering is wiping out the genetic diversity of plants. You cannot continue to have a banana and keep changing its genetic diversity to such a point where it's no longer a banana. Okay, so you either have a banana or you have something else. <laughs> Create food for billions only as long as there is money. The day money disappears, uh, we don't produce food for billions. We don't produce anything at all. Okay, so uh, this notion that, oh, we can produce, yeah, only because of money. That's how our the human system works, okay? Not the ants, not the bees. The humans work that way, okay? And so we have no difference in, from them because in the sense, uh, all we need is food, water, air, you know, and that's what they need. And the only reason we have food and water is we produce it artificially. You know, in other words, we plant it, we, we do something to produce it, and we only do it for money. So if money disappears, there's no one who's going to put their foot to the shovel, okay? So that's the issue here. Again, not voluntarily. It's just the way Mother Nature designed it for humans. Okay, uh, fellow here raises another issue. <laughs> it was kind of funny. He says, uh, talks about ruminants. Okay, so he says, man would go extinct by being unable to sustain the most important food source. Okay, what is that? Ruminants, which convert inedible plant matter into nutrients. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we absolutely need the horses and the cows, right? No, uh, I don't think we ruminants have anything at all to do with the survival of humans. Now, uh, do we need these animals to chew the cud for us, you know? <laughs> you know, again, uh, we, pro we could probably do with without most of the animals on Earth, maybe with, without all of them. We don't need the animals. Maybe, maybe we need them for pollination, you know, that sort of thing. We could do that maybe artificially and grow our own crops. We could get rid of all the weeds that we don't need. We could get rid of certainly all the dangerous animals on Earth. We don't need sharks, we don't need uh, lions, we don't need wolves, we don't need uh, elephants, we don't need any dangerous animal on earth. We have no need for them whatsoever. In fact, we probably would be doing them a favor, and I know a lot of animal lovers will kill me for that, <laughs> uh, by killing them, by murdering them, all the animals on earth that are dangerous to humans. Uh, we don't need them. They're not part of our um, you know, food pyramid. We need cows. We can grow them without lions. So we can. We need pigs. We need uh, you know chickens. We don't need them, but we we do eat them. I mean that's part of our diet today. But we don't need these other animals, dangerous animals. Why do we have them? Just just to make fun of them? Just put them in a circus, in a zoo, hunt them? Uh, you know, poach them? What's the purpose of having lions? And you might say, well, how about the beauty? Well, you can see it on YouTube. We've already filmed lions from every corner of you know of the world, and so we know what a lion looks like. Like we know what a mastodon looks like. Have you ever seen a mastodon, a real one? Have you touched it? Have you gone to the circus or to the zoo and seen a mastodon or a mammoth? No, we haven't. And we don't need to see them in real life. If you want to see one, well, you can go to a museum. They have all these, you know, uh, films of what they look like. We've reconstructed them. We can do the same thing with lions, with bears, with all these dangerous animals that we have no use for on Earth. And you, another person might say, well, how about the ecological balance of blah, blah. No, that's uh, taking it too far. Just like when the mastodons disappear, humans did not disappear, neither did other animals disappear because, you know, the mastodons or the mammoths disappeared. In the same way, if the lions disappear tomorrow, nothing will happen to humans. So this notion that there's going to be an ecological imbalance is, again, it's, uh, it's overblown. And it's uh, 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 animal lovers. And yet those same animal lovers usually do not complain or the other way around. They complain about insects because they're usually are not <laughs> insect lovers, especially some of these disgusting insects, you know, that have weird, uh, um, you know, habits or societies or whatever. And they, they're, they're afraid or they don't like these insects. Uh, but beautiful animals like, you know, the majestic elephant and the t uh, lion and the tiger, oh, we want to conserve those. So th there's a double standard there, okay? So, uh, yeah, you can beat me up. But uh, just keep that in mind. These people are not consistent. Also, we have to be consistent. We're going to allow all animals to live. We've got to allow the bacteria to live, you know, that are killing us as well. We might as well let everything live. No, we kill bacteria that are harmful. And in the same way, we should be killing lions and bears and wolves and other animals that we do not need. Okay? Sorry for the breaking the news, okay? Anyways, I, and I used to be an animal, animal lover. I mean, I love dogs and so on. But 
I mean, let's be realistic. We don't need lions. That's the honest truth. Okay, a fellow says, food will go away when money goes away, okay, and that will happen because money buys less and less. Yeah, true. Now, it takes so much dollars just to provide the basic, yeah. All currency is spazzing out, okay. It all seems like temp and water lack or overabundance storms are making some popular crops unavailable. Resources have been squandered. The population is at an impossible number. Seems like we are functionally extinct already. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. I, it's a good summary in, in many aspects of what I propose as well. I'm saying we are functionally ex extinct. We're not having children. That's one uh, because of density dependent birth rates. So we're not uh, having children anymore. And so, uh, or fewer and fewer women are deciding to have children, um, and which means that, you know, the population is not being replaced. There are st still some countries where the, the population uh, is expanding. Uh, quite drastically still, but even countries like Nigeria used to have like seven, uh, as an average, seven children per woman and uh, or per couple, and now it's uh, down to three. So if you look at some of these countries, their uh, birth rates have dropped significantly, even in those that traditionally are known as, you know, uh, countries that put out too many kids. You know, those are stopping as well. Why? Because they moved to the cities. That's why. It's got nothing to do with NGOs or, or the UN, United Nations um, doing something. In fact, uh, recently there was an article on China, and it says that women in China do not want to have children. In fact, couples, men as well, don't want to have children. And so this notion that uh, the new government or the government now put out saying that, uh, well, we're going to stop this one child per family, and we can have up to two, and we're going to stop that too, and now we can have up to three. Women say, we're not even going to have one. And again, it's because people have moved to the cities, there are economic constraints, culture changes, there are many factors that limit uh, having children. And so people are not having children today in the cities. Whenever you go to the cities, children are out. It's the transition from the country to the cities that kills children. Okay? Don't listen to all these other people say, well, they have all these uh, organizations that tell women, especially poor women, not to have children because they can't support them and this and that. No, no, it's got to do with moving from the country to the city. Once, uh, that's the globally, okay? So as people move to the cities, they stop having children, irrespective of what happened in the past. Their great-grandfathers, their culture, whatever was in their culture in the past, when they move to the city, they change their culture, their economics, their habits, the whole works, okay? So it's the transition from the country to the city that stops birthing. That's what we argue here in this site. Okay, along the same lines, a person says, or asks, says, um, about testosterone, says, uh, why is testosterone declining? Is it because of the cities or because of genetic change? Um, I think it's, uh, and I always ha have an uh, uh, exchange of words with my son, Hans, because uh, he's more into the nurture and I'm more into the nature. Okay, So we do not see eye to eye on these issues completely. And what happens here is I believe it's that we've exhausted our genetic diversity. That's essentially it. And at the end of a species lifetime, species lifetime, right? Um, when it's exhausted its genetic diversity, it has no way of regaining it again. And that's when it whittles slowly into death, unless a mass extinction gets them, right? And so I think that what happens towards the end is you have uh, uh, genetically similar individuals that have children and those children come out wrong. They come out autistic, they come out uh, with the wrong sexes, you know, mixed sexes or whatever. Uh, these are all, as far as I'm concerned, these are all um, genetically uh, and, and gendered um, uh, results. Okay? This is what comes out of uh, mixing two people with similar genetic code. And so, yeah, I think that what's happening there uh, regarding testosterone and all these things that uh, we're having these days, men are also having fewer sperm counts and so on today. And I think it's all related to genetic diversity. We have exhausted it. So whoever you marry today is genetically, from a genetic point of view, is either your sister or your brother. And if you have uh, sex with your sister, well, you might have a kid there, you know, but either that kid or the next generation, there's going to be problems. Okay, and the Amish are a good example of that. In fact, I was in Iceland and I was pondering about the Icelanders that maybe because, you know, they came from the same stock of Vikings a thousand years ago, approximately, okay? Um, you know, today there's 350,000 inhabitants in Iceland. They've received immigration, of course, but most of them are, come from the, that Viking stock a thousand, a thousand, a hundred, a thousand, two hundred years ago. And the question is, if they all, or a lot of them, or most of them come out of that stock and they've been intermarrying, the question is, you know, at some point, you would think that there's going to be some problems. 
And so I'm wondering if Iceland is having any problem. Of course, they have a relatively small population, 350,000, I think, in the whole island, more or less. So, you know, it's something that needs to be studied, just like the Amish. Okay, okay uh, another fellow brings up another issue. He says, let me get this thing here. Uh, what about the adverse effects of race mixing? Uh -huh. <laughs> For example, when Caucasian meets sub-Saharan African as if humans met with um, Neanderthals, just on a lower scale. I think it's a little different. Okay, I'll get to that in a second. Sure, there can be offspring, but wouldn't a human of one race instinctively find another different, at least in nature, assuming we would live in this urbanized world? Well, the first thing is we can't avoid uh, the urbanized war, uh, world. And the second thing is that this is politics. This is not science. Um, if you take a black man, a yellow man, a white man, a brown man, you take any of those, or if there are green men out there, fine, take them as well. Uh, and you put them together, we can have children. We can have children. A white guy like me can have children with a black woman. A uh, yellow guy can, can have uh, children with a brown woman and any combination that you wish to see there. Uh, why? Because we are the same species. What is race? Well, race, uh, aside from the pigmentation and maybe other factors, is more a political issue, which is what this gentleman is, uh, gentleman, I think, this visitor <clears throat> is raising. Okay? Uh, this is the, what you got to look at in science. Okay, and we, here we're going to compare science against, uh, you know, uh, politics. This is more or less our genealogical tree. Uh, you don't have to believe in it, but this is what I work off of, more or less. Uh, I think there's been an evolution in humans from way back when, you know, since, at least I would say since, since Homo habilis. Maybe he wasn't part of our lineage. I think there has to be someone in, uh, two million years ago that was part of our lineage. Otherwise, you know, we wouldn't be here. And I think Homo habilis is a good place to start. Then we went to Homo erectus, and we went through uh, different um, intermediators, in, intermediate, uh, I guess you could call them missing links or semi-missing links. We've got some uh, samples from intermediate periods. And we ended up where we are today. But uh, some people say, well, we mixed with the Neanderthals, and what we have today is uh, some Neanderthal blood from our great-grandfathers, the Neanderthals. Well, I think that's uh, fantasy. That's nonsense. Uh, it comes from the genetic world. Okay? I think these two individuals, the Cro-Magnons or Cro-Magnon and, um, and the Neanderthals were very different species. They would not be able to breed or inbreed right, or interbreed uh, and have viable children. And there you can see the skulls. I hope you can tell the difference between them. You can tell me which one is the human, which one is the Neanderthal. And you don't have to be an expert, believe me. You look at those skulls and you know that guy is different. And you don't need to go to college to understand that. And so I think they were radically different in great measure because the Neanderthals um, evolved from Heidelbergs, who evolved from Homo erectus in uh, France, England, um, Germany, Spain. That whole region, I think, was populated close to a million years ago, maybe 800,000, 900,000 years ago. Uh, we have the site in Happisburg in England uh, where apparently uh, there was someone there, a two-footed human or animal or whatever. Maybe it was a monkey, maybe it was a gorilla, but it looks quite a bit like Homo erectus. And from that fellow, 800,000, 900,000 years ago, uh, came to Heidelberg maybe uh, seven, 600,000 years ago, from which came the Neanderthals maybe 500, 400,000 years ago. That's more or less the, the picture that I have in my mind. Here's humans. They come from Africa. Again, uh, that's my version of it. Okay, I, I like that version. I think humans uh, migrated from Africa, met uh, Europe. At some point, they wanted to go into Europe. I think the Neanderthals killed anyone who crossed their border. I think they, they were uh, locals. Uh, they had the, the climate in their favor. They were used to that climate. They wore no clothes. Uh, we had to go with clothes in there because we were cold. And we tried to hunt in their territories. They probably slaughtered us. And the only time that humans were finally able to make it across the border, maybe around 35,000 years ago, was when the Neanderthals went away, when they were extinct. And that was around 40,000 years ago, 5,000 years before we entered Europe. That's at least what the objective record shows. Okay? So the first human that we have, a skeleton, has been dated to 30, uh, in Europe, uh, was dated to 35,000 years ago. And the last Neanderthal, according to one study, an important study, by the way, says that uh, the culture, the um, Neanderthal culture disappeared uh, sometime around 40,000 years ago.
So you reach your own conclusions. Uh, that's my conclusion that we never met the Neanderthals. We met them, uh, but they slaughtered us. And the only time we really were able to get into Europe was because of um, uh, they disappeared. And so I don't think we ever mated with them. But had we met them, well, it would have been kind of strange for, you know, uh, first communication. What do you say? Ugo, 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 or something like that to say, I, I want to sleep with you, lady. And then I don't think the, the <laughs> human, if he had two eyes, <laughs> He would have slept with a Neanderthal woman any more than you would have slept with a chimpanzee. That's more or less the way I see that. Uh, I think he would run the other way. So no, I don't think we ever made it. We were very different species. And uh, being different species means that you cannot have viable offspring. That's my take on that. Okay, here's uh, along the same lines, I think, uh, species, race. Uh, people raise political issues rather than scientific issues sometimes. Uh, try to tell a hotel that there is no genetic difference between races and they'll tell you otherwise. Uh -huh. What is a hotel? Well, it's a person who's either uh, typically a black man, okay, because this really applies to white men and yellow men as well, okay. We're all racist down deep inside us in a way or one way or another, okay. We see someone that's green and we say, well, that guy's different than me, you know. In that sense, we're all racist, okay. But this is what a hotel is specifically, a person who's either a clueless parody of Afrocentricity or loudly, conspicuously, and obnoxiously pro-black, but anti-progress. Uh -huh. These are black people who believe that sexist responsibility, politics, and gender roles are pillars of honor and tools to overthrow racism. Uh, as such, they consider gay and feminist agendas to be strategic attacks against the fight for black liberation. They overindulge in conspiracy theories about everything from aliens to the Illuminati and tend to lean towards uh, folk, uh, African motives. And, uh, Couturements in their day-to-day -day lives. A hotel is often de uh, deployed comically in black communities, especially on social media, in response to certain eye-roll-worthy content. In other words, a lot of black people make fun of their own black hotels. But you know, a lot of what this uh, says here, that that's came out of that article, by the way, and um, a lot of what that person says there applies to any race. We have whites which are like that. We have all kinds of uh, all, all the races on earth have something like that. They have people within their race that think maybe their race is superior or hates the other race. There's, there's all kinds of mixtures out there. So that hotep applies really to any race. Uh, I just wanted to address the issue of uh, conspiracy theories and all I want to say is that you got to choose your conspiracy theories um, selectively. You know, you got to select them very carefully. Are there conspiracies out there? The answer is yes. There are conspiracy theories and there are conspiracies by governments especially by the U.S. government. And people say, no, how can a democratic government do such things? You know, this is the uh, culture of Washington and Jefferson. They wouldn't do those things, elected officials. And these people have a problem because they're not in touch with the real world at all. And here, I'll, I'll give you just one example, okay? Just one example here. And that's uh, where the United States has admitted in doing a false flag. And that started the Vietnam War, or essentially, uh, ramped it up, okay, because there was a war already. But it's uh, the Gulf of Tonkin, okay, and this incident that really, you could say, started the Vietnam War. The original American report blamed North Vietnam for both incidents, but the Pentagon Papers, the memoirs of Robert McNamara, and NSA publication from 2005 suggest that the, the, dismi that the dismissed by Department of State and other government personnel of legitimate concerns regarding the veracity of the sound of the second incident was used to justify an escalation by the U.S. To, to a state of war against North Vietnam. Okay, so the United States created this Gulf of Tonkin uh, incident on purpose to, to be able to have a justification to have a war. And you say, well, government elected officials did this, okay? Well, it goes a little deeper than that. And let me show you here, okay? Give me a second here, because uh, you're gonna listen to uh, a murderer. And that murderer is a president or was a president of the United States. Okay. And here it is. Give me a second here. I'll put it on because it's with sound. Okay. Here it goes. It says 1961 Vietnam President Diem's brother shaking the hand of his murderer, future U.S. President Lyndon Johnson. November 1, 1963, the Diem brothers are arrested and murdered. November 23, 22 days later, JFK is murdered. And on August 2 and 4, 64, a few months later, Gulf of Tonkin incident starts the Vietnam War. They started with me on Jim, you remember. Yeah. He was corrupt and he ought to be killed. So we killed him. We all got together and got a goddamn bunch of thugs and we went in and assassinated him. Okay, so uh, do uh, American presidents murder people? Yes, they do murder people. 
And you say, well, that was the enemy and they had to do it for political reason, for military reason, whatever. That's not the, the issue. That's a political. <laughs> the facts are the U.S. presidents do kill people. Let me see if I say that again. Uh, a fellow asked about uh, how species are created, and I'm saying that the first one is this. Fellows that um, studied uh, the notion that, um, uh, you know, that chromosomes play an important role in the development of a species. And in Dobzhansky there, he came up with a notion that first uh, species develop in isolation. And maybe he wasn't the first one to say that. But uh, he said that, uh, again, genetic uh, mutation plays a crucial role. And so I developed that chart showing that in isolation, uh, at first, a species changes its genetic diversity, uh, its genetic um, material quickly. There is a lot of mutations. And then once it stabilizes at some point and they become sedentary, then they can only lose it from then on because all they're doing is inbreed, unless they really mix with, you know, some uh, similar animal that uh, they found out there, which is unlikely. Okay, I think uh, essentially, you know, they, they continue losing genetic uh, material until they're all essentially clones. And then after that, uh, they die shortly after. Okay, and um, here's another issue raised by this fellow. He says uh, the Amish... He says the Amish have guns. Yeah, I know they have guns. The issue is that they don't use them to kill people, but this law says most of the Amish have great aim and will defend themselves. Not true. Not true at all. In fact, uh, World War I and World War II, they had problems with them, and they put a lot of these Amish in prison because they were not willing to go to war and fight. And so this notion that this fellow has that, you know, the Amish will defend themselves is absolutely wrong. Never happened, never will. The Amish will not kill another human. You can kill all of them until they finally decide to, you know, th they'd rather go to heaven than kill you. Essentially, that's what it comes down to. Okay, another fellow says, says the AIs, artificial intelligence. We do a lot of work on that uh, these days, okay? And do you think man's accelerated development could also be responsible for accelerated extinction? Well, your thoughts on general artificial intelligence. Um, I think so. I think that the fact that um, we have, you know, in the last... 100 years, 200 years, we developed so much technology, and that was, you could say, exponential. And our population also expanded exponentially. Okay, so both were exponential, our economics, everything expanded exponentially in great measure because the population expanded exponentially. But then at some point, population kept growing, but we turned a corner on technology, okay? Because manufacturing started dying as, as a percentage of GDP, and as a percentage of labor. And today, you know, it's almost all, 85% maybe, is services, all kinds of services. And what has happened to um, manufacturing? It's only about 15%. So anything you invent today, okay, it's just a modification on an existing thing, something maybe nice to have there that's not critical and that's not gonna put millions of people to work and it's not gonna overtake services as part of our economy. So yeah, I think there's been an accelerated evolution, both social, economic, economic and uh, in population as well. There's a, 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 um, a tremendous evolution that we've suffered in the last 100 years. And again, I think this conduces to, uh, you know, the, the final curve for man. And as far as artificial intelligence, yeah, I don't have much to say on that. Um, it does take away jobs. You have all these arms that do a lot of mechanical work that humans used to do. They do it faster. They do it more efficiently. They don't go on strike. They don't need to, you don't need to pay uh, social security for them or, you know, anything like that. They don't go on retirement. Uh, and, you know, these machines work faster, more efficiently, etc. It's part of man's progress in manufacturing. But what that does is push people into services because there is no work or no more labor intensive work in uh, necessary in manufacturing. So that's the only thing that we have on that I have to say about artificial intelligence. It's, it's simply not, it's not in our favor. It, I don't even see it as something good or bad. I see it as something that is happening. We can't avoid it because we're trying to become more efficient and it's going to have consequences. That's, that's where I stop. It just is. It is what it is. That's it. Uh, not bad, not good. It's just what it is. Okay? And yeah, we are moving into a world where we have uh, a lot more uh, automation. Okay. In fact, I just came from a country that's got tons of automation. It's unbelievable. It, uh, Iceland is the most expensive country in the world. And I don't think there, I saw a single store where you don't do self-checkout. There's only one person manning the, the machines there. 
everybody goes with their phones and just buys stuff and transfers money from you know through the internet it's just unbelievable uh iceland is very advanced in all those things only a country of 350,000 people but it's very advanced okay so uh here's some homework for people whoever wants to tackle it okay let's see if you can answer the question or you do research and try to answer this question here's a question okay okay i uh, read it well it says uh, why did the fauna right in the seas disappear at the same time as the animals on land more or less you know maybe there was some time difference but essentially they disappeared at the same time in the big five mass extinctions okay because you can see a layer in the rock that suddenly all these animals are wiped out there could be you know some thousands of years maybe hundreds of thousands of years difference there but essentially essentially they disappeared geologically at the same time the question is why can you come up with a mechanism? And hopefully you'll consider selectivity, okay? Because you gotta explain selectivity. How does mother nature spare one animal and allow another animal to live? In other words, spare one species or set of species, orders, and liquidate the others. That's, you gotta, you gotta factor selectivity in there. 